Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Bike Powered Food Scrap Collection, Spotlight on Equipment. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliances, Composting for Community Initiative. This webinar is one in a series that the Institute offers to advance composting, and particularly to share working models and tips for replication. The one today is part of our work to specifically support the growing community composter movement and sector. Community composters are a vital piece of the distributed infrastructure, so we love working uh, with you all. Today, we're going to hear from three pedal-powered food scrap collection and composting service providers. We have Domingo Medina, Peels and Wheels Composting in Connecticut, Jan Masterlers from Bennett Compost in Pennsylvania, and Kat Nigro with Compost Now in North Carolina. The focus will be on equipment from buckets to bikes and trailers and probably everything in between. At the end of this webinar, we're going to ask you what you'd like our next spotlight topic to be. So please stay to participate in our poll. I can tell you that here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we've identified at least 18 bike-powered food scrap collection operators in 11 different states in the, in, in the U.S. and the most challenging part of today's webinar was selecting the three to feature as they all are so awesome. Now these bike haulers, they're neighborhood scale operations. They are inherently local. I think you have to be if you're bike powered. They keep, keep food scraps locally. They convert it into local compost for local soil to grow local food. So this is um, really, uh, completely aligns with ILSR's mission to promote homegrown economies and local self-reliance. Um, so we're going to, before I introduce the first speaker, speaker, Domingo from Peels and Wheels, we're going to just do a few polling questions to get a sense of who's on the line and, and what you're doing and where you are. So uh, Virginia Streeter, my colleague, is helping with the uh, webinar today. Thanks, Virginia. First polling question. So who do you represent? Are you government, nonprofit, private business? Are you a community scaled composter, a hauler? Are you a consultant? And I'm sorry if you don't fit into any of these categories, but we are limited to five. So we have more than half the votes in. I always like to try to get to 80% of you voting. All right, Virginia, we're close, 77%. And okay, more than a third nonprofit and a little less than a third are actually community scale compost or haulers. For those of you representing government, thank you for participating. We need your support. All right, next question is really where you are located. All right, go ahead, Virginia, let's see the results. East Coast, most of you are in the East Coast, not so much represent, representation on the West Coast, we'll have to work on that. Like to see, oh, nobody international yet, okay. All right, the next question is, is just getting a sense if you're already operating a bike powered in enterprise or you're interested in starting one or you want to support bike powered collection or if you're in fall into a different category. Sixty-five percent of you have voted. Keep voting. All right, let's see the results. Ooh, look at that. 36% of you are interested in starting a bike collection and almost a third in supporting. Fabulous. Okay, and then the last question is, for those of you who are collecting food scraps with or without bikes, how many customers do you have? We just wanna get a sense of your size. So this is really only for those of you who are already collecting food scraps or or if you if you want to, that's okay. If you're still, because so many of you are interested in doing this, but get a sense of where you think you would be in the number of customers. All right, um, another few seconds. Votes are still coming in. All right, let's share the results. We had 41% participate, which makes sense. 
So of those of you who participate in this poll, some of you are really small, 50 customers, under 100, almost another third. So, and under 7%, more than 500. So again, we're talking small service providers. Okay, thank you, Virginia. So um, I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Domingo, Med Domingo Medina from Peels and Wheels Composting in New Haven, Connecticut. And one thing I'll just say at the outset that that these community composters have the best names for their enterprises. Peels and Wheels is a example of that. Um, they use bikes and haulers to collect and compost food scraps, not only from households, but also from schools and small businesses. And Domingo created the enterprise in partnership with New Haven Farms, which is a nonprofit promoting health and community development through urban ag. Uh, with the shared understanding that transforming organic waste into compost for urban and rural farms and gardens is an opportunity to improve the air, soil for the local community and grow more food. So, um, Domingo, uh, hit full screen and unmute yourself and take it away. Welcome. Hey, well, thank you for having me. This is very exciting for me to be able to share my learning curve, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, bikes and then hauling and composting in the city has been you know challenging for us but uh, we have been doing it this is our fifth year now and um you know we're very excited to to be able to share with you what we have learned um so we are let me see how do i change uh, the slides okay here we go so i'm here in new haven connecticut this is a view from east rock uh, you can see there's a very flat area where we get to go and uh, we basically operate in a five mile radius uh, from where we have our composting facility that is basically a, at the a very close to downtown in an area called Fairhaven. You can see where you can see the Long Island Sound. And so for a bike um, operation, you need to have a, a good understanding of how much area you can cover um, uh, when it's bike uh, powered. So this is a little bit of view. Uh, if the land of Yale University is the land of the New Haveners, and this is where we are doing our business. So, you know, as Brenda mentioned, you know, what is the pain we're trying to solve? And this is what, that's what triggered us uh, in uh, the whole um, enterprise is that right now New Haven, uh, basic Connecticut, they don't have landfills anymore. And uh, now we incinerate everything. All our trash goes to hold, being hauled um, by uh, trucks, the city pays $85 a ton to haul this material out and gets burned in municipal incinerators. And we know for a fact that incinerators generate a lot of pollution, including mercury, the positions on our soil. And that has a lot of implication for human health. Like, you know, uh, we have one of the largest incidents of pulmonary cancer and asthma in the state of Connecticut. And I'm not saying because of incineration, but certainly incineration doesn't help. The other thing that we have also is that we have a lot of contaminants in our soils, like many cities in the Northeast. We have lead, we have arsenic, and we have other me heavy metals. Uh, so, you know, composting is a way to help out to mitigate and minimize uh, the impact of, of, of these um, issues. And then there are very little uh, composting opportunities. Uh, the large, large operators uh, are basically one hour and a half from here. And uh, Connecticut has been moving more towards anaerobic digesters. Uh, but you still need to haul a uh, long, long distances. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a puzzle for us. And so this is our value proposition from the point of view of our business. We are a neighborhood pedal power, food scrap uh, pickup and composting service, mainly for residents, but also we uh, help small businesses that want to conveniently compost, but do not have the capability to do so and want their waste to be recycled to enrich uh, the soils in New Haven while mitigating environmental pollution. And of course, uh, we at the same time, we create some jobs uh, that are very much needed in the city. Uh, this is what we do, and uh, this summarizes uh, uh, you know, our efforts. We promote and facilitate solutions for composting needs, again, for residents, small business, and schools. We try to, all what we produce goes for enriching our soils, for growing healthy food. So a lot of urban farms, urban gardens, uh, receive much of the benefits of the compost that we produce. Uh, we enrich our place by in mitigating environmental pollution that come from incineration. And of course, it all is done uh, provided through a pedal powered pickup and composting service. 
and but we also you know do a lot of bit of consulting for looking for a innovative solution whether it be in the backyard of a house whether it be you know on a community garden or in a school and we support in serious waste events and we do a lot of soil analysis for amending soils and of course a lot of pro, uh, training and education uh, even though you know we are a business we also put, you know we have the sense that uh, part of our work is to educate our community about what we do and they, again this is a little bit of a target market you know uh, you know given that we charge for our services you know we are aiming at residents of new haven people that are environmentally concerned uh, you know mainly students family professionals and small businesses and schools uh, and there are you know pe people that are willing to pay to divert uh, their organic residue from their trash into composting something that's very interesting is that you know i right now have around 150 clients i would say that 90 percent are women uh, you know professional women young women uh, people uh, women that are also students people that come from california and come from Seattle and Washington and San Francisco, you know, professionals, the mostly uh, doctors and the lawyers and uh, uh, again, young professionals. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a different type of, of population that is willing to pay for a service like this. This is a, basically what we do is a way to summarize what we do. We want, we want to capture a percentage of the trash that goes to municipal incineration uh, we basically divert it from the trash. Uh, we have a pickup or a drop off uh, that is can be weekly or bi weekly, and it works year round. All is being collected uh, um, uh, using a bicycle with a system of a trailer and bins. Uh, and then we bring it to a site that Phoenix Press uh, in Fairhaven, where everything is being processed using an RA80 static pile system. And in a matter of 60 days, we can produce enough quality compost that we give away uh, that we can donate or even sell if we wanted to uh, to people that need it uh, it certainly goes back to the people that pay for the first service for free but those that are not can buy uh, or we get donated uh, we feel that this is the way we close the loop within the city really bring it back not to the backyard but bring it back to where things are being produced and you know it's very simple we pay your yeah, people pay seven dollars and fifty uh, a week so that's around $30 a month, you know, $3 for each $7.50 goes to bikers. I believe bikers have a lot of work to do year round, working under uh, extreme conditions of weather uh, at times, but also at risks exposed to, you know, injury uh, driving through the, uh, through the road. So I believe that they, they need to be paid well. The rest of the money, $4.50, basically gets distributed for people that do composting to deal with liability and workers' compensation, to pay for water, for nuisance management, for maintenance, and of course, of course, to reinvest back into the business. So this is a, a sample of the distribution of, the, uh, our, of our composters. I don't call, call them clients, I call them composters, but I try to keep them within um, um, a radius of four miles uh, to the center of where we have our compost facility. Uh, right now we you know we have 150 people and uh, you know we feel that it's very sustainable uh, uh, to do it in, within this range of distance and uh, this is a description basically we use a uh, regular bikes but we also use electrical bikes uh, our trailers uh, has the capacity of carrying four to eight 18 gallon bins these are the rubber made uh, bins uh, each trailer, I have two types of trailers that I'm going to explain a little bit later, but the trailers are, uh, can carry up to 300 to 600 pounds, uh, depending on, on the type. Uh, the weight capacity, um, I think I repeat the same information in both, I, I apologize. Uh, but here the hauling maximum capacity ranges between 300 to 400 pounds. This is what a regular biker, a trained biker can actually haul with that weight. And that, for me, is an average between 37.5 to 40 households uh, uh, that you can actually haul in one route uh, uh, before you are heading back. And those are examples of the of the type of bins. By the way, the rubber-made bins, I don't know what's happening to them, but they have disappeared. They're out of the market. Uh, and there's, no th there's nothing compatible in, in terms of quality. And that's something of concern because these are designed, you know, the, these trailers are designed uh, for to be able to fit these trailer uh, these bins properly 
and stack them uh, and be able to hold them safely. So that's a that's a, a, an important thing to consider. Key things that I think are important uh, that I've been thinking about, uh, you know, the, some key things and some constraints in using bikes for community composting. You know, for, I think they're very efficient to, uh, to cover routes, you know, where you minimum, you know, you can carry 20 households, uh, the weight of 20 households. That's between 160 to 100 pounds of organic waste per route. Uh, this will be the minimum. And this is what I, I, I provide uh, when I have a new biker starting. Uh, that's the minimum amount of household I provide them. And, but above that, you require somebody that has legs, uh, you know, has some stamina. Uh, but you can also do it with a with a with an electrical bike. That will be a great of assist. The thing, uh, the good thing about bikes is that is the accessibility to sidewalks, to driveways, to back doors, uh, to move around the city. Um, it basically minimizes the fuel use. It's a very low startup cost compared to using a truck. Um, you know, the importance of using disc brakes because when things get heavy and you need to, you know, brake in a traffic or going downhill, you know, you need to do it in a safe way. I like it because also we reduce congestion and pollution uh, in many, many ways. But of course it has some limitation. It's, you know, it can be difficult in extreme weather, mostly when it's snowy, when things are very difficult to go around the city. He has certainly a limit in carrying capacity, uh, you know, when you compare it to other type of, of, of things. But, you know, you can do one or two routes per day. Uh, that covers a lot of, a lot of ground. And of course, you're going to be, as a biking, as a biker, you're going to have risk. You're going to be on, on, on the road. Uh, you can be hit by a car or you can hit a car if you're not paying attention. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's major risk uh, in, in that regard. A little bit about uh, the systems. Uh, I use an, a you know a couple of electrical bikes that I that I, there's a company out on 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 uh, I think it's uh, in New Jersey, and it's a it's a great uh, uh, motor that it's, uh, it's produced. Uh, it's an, a U.S. technology. It's a direct drive brushless disc brake compatible motor that you attach. You can attach it to the front the, the front wheel or the rear wheel uh, wheel. Uh, what's important here is that is to pay attention to motors that uh, that can actually carry a lot of weight. And when you are after looking for motors for your bicycle, uh, you not only have to look at the torque uh, uh, of your bicycle, but also how large is the motor. Uh, and this is key because uh, motors can get the, uh, the, the, the motors that run very, very fast are not that good for actually um, uh, carrying a lot of weight. Uh, and that's something that you want to consult with your, uh, with your provider is, you know, what's the maximum load? This particular um, uh, wheel uh, motor can actually uh, stipulate it to a maximum load of 600 pounds. So that's pretty safe. Uh, I burned, uh, you know, at least a couple of, of motors in the very beginning that were of a high speed that I could run 26 uh, miles per hour, uh, but wasn't used to going stop and going, stop and going with a lot of heavy load and actually got burned. It got, uh, it got heated up very quickly and it burned the mechanism. These type of, of motors are large enough that allows for, um, uh, first that is it's gearless uh, and it's a large motor size that allows for dissipating the, the heat very, very quickly. And, uh, and I think it is, it's very, very key. There are many out there, uh, but you know, maximum torque is a, is a question. Uh, and also how, how, what's the maximum load that can carry depending on how much you're planning to carry. And this has to do with not only the weight of your bike, the weight of the biker, the weight of your trailer, and of course the weight you're planning to carry per, per route. And that's something to, to pay attention to. Uh, and something that is key in all this proposition is the type of battery that you're going to use. And there are many types of batteries there. Um, the one that I use is 48 volts uh, that is a capable of, of producing 22 amps. And that gives me more or less, you know, um, 20 miles uh, in a flat surface. Uh, of course, that depends on how you use your throttle, how you use your, you know, how skillful you are between using the speeds of your bike in combination with your throttle. Um, but, you know, for me, I can cover my route very easily uh, and always have electricity at the end of the week. 
Um, one thing, this is just, just an example of the two type of, uh, of motors. Um, uh, the ones that I'm using is the brushless DC motors. They are very, uh, very highly efficient in many, many ways. This is something that you can ask what type of motors are, but mostly the continuously running motors are brushless type of, of motors that you'll find in many appliances. Um, so that's something that you might uh, get excited to understand how they, how, how they work. And then some advantages, you know, certainly the Brosnan motors are very high and efficient, you know, between 85 and 90 percent efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it can be controlled very easily with me, me, feedback mechanisms that many bikes have. Uh, and the, basically the key here to delivery, uh, to deliver precise the type of torque and rotation speed that you might need at the time that you that you're running your bike. And it's of high durability. The one that I have right now has been running since 2010 and it keeps on going. Uh, so it's pretty neat in that regard. And then the type of trailer, uh, many of you might be very familiar with the uh, bikes at work. It's, uh, uh, they have three different types of length of, of, of trailers. I use the 64 inch cargo length uh, where I can put four to eight, uh, eight 18 gallon bins. And I also have the same size, but with the two type, you know, with four wheels where I can carry up to 600 pounds if I wanted to. And you see that there's a standard width and there's a wide width. I use the standard width because the 18 gallon bins fit very nicely uh, there. Uh, and then of course you have the two wheelers and the four wheelers that, uh, that can carry more weight than the other. All these are attached to a bike with, uh, you know, with standard hitches or you can ask for a, a customized hitches if you want. And the other neat thing about these trailers is that they're pretty light, but also you can extend their back. You know, they are modular, so you can extend more uh, your, your trailer. Something that is key here is where, how to carry your bins. And, and something that one mistake that I made a few years ago is that I had the wheel all the way in the back. Um, and every time I was carrying the load in my, my trailer, basically was lifting my bike. So you want to have your wheel more towards the center as the uh, image shows and to load your, your, your weight, you know, around that wheel. Uh, so it becomes, everything becomes very, very stable. And, uh, and you know, to finish my presentation, uh, because I think the questions are gonna be much more interesting. It's, you know, there's a type of report card that we provide uh, for us, it's very, very important, the philosophy around how are we mitigating environmental pollution. So our translation into metric tons of CO2 equivalent are important for us. Demonstrate that we are actually taking cars off the road or we are minimizing the amount of, of gasoline being consumed or how much carbon we are sequestrating by this type of, of technology. Uh, so this is kind of a report cards that we do uh, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis. So that's about it. I, I don't want to take more time. I want to uh, hear from every, everybody else. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it to the rest of the group. Yes, thank you, Domingo. Awesome. Um, and I'll, you know, you mentioned incineration and Connecticut in particular is one of the states that's very reliant on uh, waste incineration. We released a report uh, earlier this week on waste incineration called Waste Incineration, A Dirty Secret in How yeah. States Define Renewable Energy. So if yeah. folks are interested in that, please check out um, that resource. All right, we are gonna hold questions to the end. So Domingo, you mute yourself until the end. And uh, while Virginia is handing over controls to Jen, I'll introduce her. So Jen Masterlers is with Bennett Compost in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Bennett picks up food scraps and other compostables from more than 2,000 households and businesses every week. In 2018, uh, Jen joined Bennett Compost as an owner of the business. Congratulations, Jen. The pedal collection component was her initiative to lessen the amount of carbon used for food scrap collection and bring more awareness to the feasibility of pedal powered businesses. So Jen, welcome to today's uh, webinar and it is all yours. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you for hosting this. Um, I think this is so important and it's kind of our 
timely for us, uh, which you'll see why um, in the end of the year, we're working on budgeting and like plans for next year. And are we going to grow this portion of the business? So I really um, am excited about learning from everyone else. Domingo, your presentation was great. And all right, here we go. Um, so I just want to start uh, with a fun photo. Um, this is not our bike team. This is our bike team is solely um, this fellow. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the guy with the orange helmet on, um, that's Rudy. And uh, we did a charity ride this year for the first time. Um, and something uh, that I'll talk about kind of in the next a well, couple of slides down is just one of the pros of doing this collection. It's just like, it's so easy to create culture around bikes and Philadelphia has a great bike culture and um, it feels good to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, let's start. So my, uh, I wanted to start with this slide to just kind of show my road that I have taken in the compost world. I'm not going to really go into it, but I got into it in 2010, started working for a business for a couple of years. They went out of business. I started my own community thing while I was doing that. I then took over that initial business. I started the bike thing, um, in 2013, something I thought made a lot of sense. There was, um, a company in Philadelphia called Wash Cycle Laundry. I think they've expanded to DC now, if not even more places. And I was really inspired by them and their model. And like, we live in a really flat city. I'm like, this just makes a lot of sense. So just kind of started it in one neighborhood and it's really expanded from there. Um, uh, but yeah, I just want to show that it's not always super straightforward. I've had a lot of iterations of <laughs> businesses I've been a part of or started myself. Um, but I feel pretty good about uh, where I am now with Bennett Compost. Um, we are a for-profit business. Uh, we currently service almost 2,300 cust residential customers, and we are collecting 775 of those um, with the tricycle. The photo on the right, uh, that tricycle is what we're currently using. So, okay. Um, so our pros and cons um, for using pedal collections, obviously uh, Domingo hit on a lot of these too, but less emissions um, uh, for the for-profit world, it's great marketing kind of being out there as a riding billboard all the time. Um, we're different and we get asked a lot of questions and we get stopped and people generally like us and like to know what we're doing. So that feels really good. Um, the photo on the left is, this is when I was doing collections. Uh, it's a lot easier to maneuver like around city construction uh, when you're on, when you're on a, a bike or a trike, you can kind of hop on the sidewalk and get around roadblocks. Uh, obviously built in exercise. We, um, our current biker uh, joined because he is a cyclist and he's training for this amateur ride and this is just built-in training that he gets to do every single day so it really works out for for him during good weather uh it's really really pleasant um great example we're setting for our kids um and then the community thing which i talked about at the beginning we also this is something interesting um we track all of our our drivers collections and we find that our drivers um who are you know, on the the bikes or the trikes versus in trucks make less mistakes. I think it's because they're physically just closer. They're on the ground. They're closer to the buckets we pick up, but they're also, they have to move a little slower. So um, we find it's more efficient in that way. Um, and just as they're out there, we, uh, we also use pickup trucks. Uh, we have two other full-time routes uh, in pickup trucks. Two and a half, actually, and then one full time on the on the trike. Cons, um, it's a little less efficient uh, if we're comparing it to trucks in terms of cost. Um, and then in our business, where we have both, we have bis we have the pedal collections and the automobiles. There's oh, there's just like this constant comparison between the two, um, you know, on the bottom line and. It's just, for me, it's like, it's just a constant, like having to fight for the bike, um, which I always win, but it's, uh, it's, just, it's always there. It's real. Um, 
there's definitely more risk, which Domingo talked about. And um, in the Northeast, there's weather uh, to deal with. So um, kind of depending on your employee, finding an employee that that will like toughen it up and go out when it's 20 degrees um, and sleeting and kind of also knowing that line of when it's too dangerous and you have to you have to build in backups whether you're renting another vehicle or you have another vehicle available for that and uh it's hard to find those people uh who are willing to do that um when you find them they are amazing uh, but we find that they are they're hard to find and hold on to um so these are the bike types that i've used in my pedal career um we'll start the one on the left i started with a, this is a schwinn just hybrid no electric assist, super lightweight, easy. I loved it, just like mobility on and off sidewalks. Um, also super low maintenance looking back. <laughs> uh, the double kickstand was a lifesaver um, in terms of just balance of getting off and the whole uh, assembly tipping over and also super affordable. Um, this hauled, we also use the Bikes at Work trailer. Um, this is the single, same length and width as Domingo's, but the single wheel. This is our original one. Um, and it can haul 300, but comfortably, I mean, this guy and I, we definitely hauled 300, but I would say 200 felt, was much more comfortable. 300, you were really, you were really pushing it. Um, and then limited to the no electric assist, we were kind of limited in our radius. Like we were only biking around about a mile. Like I said, when we were using this, we were just doing collections in one neighborhood in Philadelphia, and we were picking up from businesses at the time, which is what those little 10-gallon bins were for. Um, and the other thing with the bikes is there's no additional storage, so it's really hard to, to have, um, you know, to have extra things in case you get a flat and to have a broom in case you have a spill, like little things like that. Um, that the trike is much more helpful with. Uh, and even with the double kick stand, it is, it's a little hard to balance sometimes. And then something to think about is that crossbar in the middle. Like if you're trying to be really efficient with doing pickups, it's easier to have the, I don't know the correct terminology, but the one that is down more in an angle that's easier to step through. So our current setup is we're using a Nihola Flex tricycle. Um, and this is electric assist. Um, the pros of this are you, there's no balance issues because it's a tricycle. Um, we can haul up to 500 pounds on the trailer. We've since upgraded to the same trailer Domingo's using the bikes that work with the double wheel, um, which is a really new purchase for us and it's been really great. So that can haul up to 600 on the back. I was just being conservative with five. And then up to 300 additional pounds in that front part of the trike. There's lots of storage uh, space. We have a bike pump on there. We carry extra tubes. Extra, I don't think we carry ex any extra actual tires. But um, uh, in our model, we we swap out buckets a lot for customers. So we have um, we we can carry extra buckets and just some products. Sometimes if we're doing product delivery, it's a lot more visible. Um, and then it's different. I wrote in this country because uh, this is a uh, Danish bike and I was in Copenhagen over the summer and I saw these things everywhere. <laughs> I was kind of like, my people. <laughs> anyway, um, and then the disc brakes are also really key. Um, we've had to replace them once on here, but they, they're just totally necessary. Um, cons, it's, uh, it's high maintenance and getting something um, from another country, it's customer service is something to consider. Uh, we had battery issues when we first bought this, and dealing with the hole was not very easy. Um, we've had a lot of issue with broken spokes on the back wheel, and I think that's just from the weight uh, that we're hauling. Um, but just something to think about is kind of the, the diameter of your spokes and how beefy those are. Um, battery issues with uh, due to the weather. Um, we've just had some like connection port issues from just being outside in the rain so much. Um, uh, yeah, harder to handle issues if you're out on the route. Just it's almost, I don't think 
that our biker can change that rear tire if he has a flat. We have to take that in. It's pretty rare that he gets one back there, but it's happened before. And it's expensive. This tricycle was, it's $8,000 new. Um, and each battery, we've had to buy a backup battery, and those are $500 as well. Um, and we've also had to rebuild the front wheels just with the beefier spokes to accommodate the weight that we put on the front of that thing. Um, but some other trike benefits, I mean, our biker, our triker Rudy has told me many times that he just, he's, he's hauling around a lot. He's doing this, um, four days a week and picking up over 150 stops a day. So it's that extra like resting position that he doesn't have to worry about balancing is like really important to him. And, uh, yeah, it can just be used for other things as well. I've gotten my Christmas tree with this thing every year since I've had it. Mm -hmm. and maintenance so this is kind of these are pictures on the fly on the route uh dealing with flats flats are our biggest uh maintenance like day-to-day -day maintenance issue um but we have a uh, our cyclist knows how to deal with it so it's just kind of proper training um for your employees to know how to to take care of the equipment is really important and someone with a little um, ingenuity helps as well. Uh, some extra features that we can't get by without are bar mitts for winter biking. Um, they, yeah, we put them on back on this morning, totally life-changing. Uh, cell phone holder, I don't have a picture of our current one, but right now we have one um, that has a built-in like waterproof case and charging component. So we track all of our stops um, so the bikers constantly. The bar mitts are great because you don't need gloves. Your hand can go in there gloveless. So you can then pull it out and input data on the um, smartphone. And then drink holders, uh, we have all kinds of um, drink holders for, you know, hand sanitizer and keys and snacks and just you need to carry around a lot <laughs> when you're working. Uh, seven hours like out of the out six and a half ish out doing collections um i'm not going to talk too much about the trailer since we're using the same one domingo uses all those totes that rubbermaid thing is so real domingo i don't know what's going on there our home depots by us sell some other version i don't remember the kind but yeah i don't think they're as good um but we are loving the dual wheels. We've added some signage, kind of makeshift signage on the back. And we also put down a, a plywood floor on the base just so we can carry other things besides those, uh, the residential totes. Um, we love this trailer. I can't imagine using any other trailer. It's super low maintenance. The first one I got, the single wheel ones, um, I bought it used. Uh, from someone off of Craigslist, and it's, we're still using it today as well. It's they've been great. And then this new one we bought, they're relatively cheap. I mean, twelve hundred fifty dollars new, and super easy to assemble. Okay, so risks. Um, unfortunately, we were hit. Uh, we were in a pretty substantial accident um, the Friday, uh, n the week after Thanksgiving. The Friday, Rudy was out for his route, and I mean, you can see all of the, in terms of safety, we have lights, we have flags, he wears reflective gear, um, but still, when you're, uh, he starts at four in the morning, because he likes to ride when there's not a lot of people on the road, and um, some questionable people are out at that time. Um, he was hit, and it was a hit and run, the driver ran away, and or drove away and our trike was basically totaled. Um, it's, it wasn't totaled, it's being repaired now, but we've been without it since then. So it's been, it's been a rough couple of weeks. Um, so some risks, uh, like I said, the early start time, I mean, he prefers to start early because less traffic, but you're also then competing with less light and um, that's a trade off. You have to figure out what works for you. Um, so yeah, proper biker, uh, training, proper signaling, knowing the rules of the road, um, helmets always, of course, 
allowing extra time. We had someone go out today for the first time on a route and just um, I gave them the whole day for 75 stops because I want the bikers to find their way, like to find their own routes that they feel comfortable on. We have the stops, but you can kind of maneuver. So as, as the owner of the business, just making sure that you're kind of allowing um, lists to succeed and allowing your, your people to feel comfortable. Um, reflective apparel. Rudy loves this, this, that little strap thing that's over his chest. Uh, it's really great for the summer when you don't really want to wear much. Um, and then another safety thing is just like a balance of like being a presence on the road. And like we bike in the road. This is like, the, I think the rules, um, definitely the rules in Philadelphia is you're not supposed to be on the sidewalk. So kind of like demanding respect from cars, but also knowing that like that doesn't always happen and trying to rein it in when you're disrespected by a car and realizing that they are in a vehicle and can hurt you. Uh, we only had one instance of that, but luckily no one was hurt. Calling, routing, route planning containers. Um, so how we do our collections is uh, for each day we have a, we're in a different neighborhood doing pickups and we've um, found transfer hubs in each of these neighborhoods that we work with, um, two community gardens, a school, and one of them is our bike shop. That's the first image you see. Everything is kind of based right around uh, our starting point, which is that little green uh, triangle there. Um, for some, we pay rent. For some, we barter. Um, and then we can fit between 40 and 60 stops on uh, kind of one leg of the route. And so we start at the home base, um, go to a leg, come back, unload, reload, and then back out. Um, each daily route is between 150 and 200 stops. Um, you can see on that second image, uh, the start triangle is where the bike's located. That's in Fishtown. And then we kind of have to bike over uh, to the to South Philadelphia where that the neighborhood of collections is and kind of right in the middle of all those lines is where our, our transfer hub is for that day. Um, so then at the end of each route, the containers get picked up. Um, all of the, those Rubbermaid totes get picked up from there by a vehicle and taken back to our, our home base, which is between three and five miles, depending on the neighborhood um, from there. And some days the biker is responsible for doing that on his own and some days not just kind of depending on how many pickups he has. And yeah, these are just examples. Uh, I started by using the 10 gallon round bins and honestly, it's a, such a pain to use the bungee cords and bungee them on. That's when I was doing commercial stuff. Um, but now that we're primarily doing residential collections on here, the, the rubber made bins work out. I mean, they're made, the trailer's made to haul them. So they work out really well. Um, and we don't swap out buckets. So our customers get five gallon buckets. We empty them into these containers and then give their buckets back. Here we are. Yeah. Um, okay. So compensation. Um, Rudy started with us in July. Uh, in 2017, making 15 an hour, um, that he started part-time. He's currently full-time. Um, he's riding for about 75% of the time. Um, he's doing site work and dealing with the product the other time and dealing with bike maintenance, stuff like that. Um, he's currently um, making 17 um, and with full benefits. He has health insurance and two weeks of uh, paid time off. And that's all I got. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say if anyone has any follow-up questions that we can't get to, there's my email address and feel free to reach out. Yeah, and so talking about questions, in your go to webinar control panel, there's um you can click on the question uh and uh spot there and feel free to even start typing your questions if you have any for domingo or jen as we bring up kat's um presentation but jen i'll just say before we move on i'm so sorry about the accident and glad that rudy's okay and i think i'll, I'll just note on your your weather con you know and how cold it is that um kat who's in north carolina <clears throat> in the raleigh dorham area i 
you know, had unexpected a lot of snow recently. So maybe she'll be looking at those bar mitts that you featured. I don't know, Kat, maybe you can talk about that at some point. But um, I'm very pleased to <clears throat> introduce Kat Nigro from Compost Now. She's the head of marketing and engagement at Compost Now, which is a doorstep collection service. She was previously the general manager of Tilthy Rich Compost. I'll let me say that again, Tilthy Rich, I love that name, <laughs> uh, before they joined forces with Compost Now last year. And Kat has just taught me so much about women empowerment through pedal power. Uh, who knew? And the importance in particular of electric assist bikes for women to get in this field. So Kat, um, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, thanks for having me, y'all. And Jen, Domingo, you guys are so awesome. I love you so much. Um, thanks for sharing everything with us. Um, I'm going to jump right in so that we have a lot of time for uh, questions. Um, and before I get started, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, my colleague and teammate Nate um, is on this webinar as well. Um, he is our head mechanic at Compost Now, and he leads our bike division. And so if anybody has any very specific questions about maintenance or the equipment or route planning or anything like that, he will also be available during our Q&A. So I encourage you to pick his brain because he is brilliant. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, uh, like Brenda said, my name is Kat. I'm the head of marketing engagement at Compost Now, and today I'm going to talk about bike hauling business model and the evolution of our equipment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, before I can talk about Compost Now, I have to talk about Tilthy Rich Compost. Um, so Tilthy Rich was a 100% bike powered compost service in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we serviced about a five mile radius from downtown Durham, and we service mainly residential and small commercial uh, members like cafes and coffee shops uh, and people like that. So we started in 2011 when our founder Chris Russo moved down to Durham from Connecticut. Um, he saw the need for organics recycling and said, hey, let's do it. Um, he's also a champion of cycling and kind of has the motto that if it can be done by bike, it should be done by bike. Um, and so that's kind of the motto we've been uh, operating under ever since. Um, so this is a photo of our very first trailer. Um, we actually bought a uh, used futon off of Craigslist and we turned it into our trailer, as you can see here. Um, at that time, we were doing a swapping business model where we would physically swap uh, a member's bin with an entirely new and clean one. Um, and so that's how our business uh, model started. All of our riders, all two of them, were contractors and they were paid about uh, $1.75 per bin collected. Um, so we got the idea to build our own by this website called Tony's Trailers. Um, and so this kind of walks you through how to make a trailer pretty much using anything. I don't know if you can see that second picture, but they built one using a shopping cart. So that's food for thought. Um, so let's talk about the pros with that trailer. Um, it was very inexpensive and it allowed us to immediate, like immediately jump into the hauling game, which is uh, really important when you don't have a lot of capital or any initial investors. Um, we were able to upcycle and recycle existing materials, which is uh, it fits in with our vision and our mission um, at Tilthy Rich Compost. But some cons. Um, that, that trailer broke down a lot. Um, and it's because it's metal. It's heavy. Um, those wheels had no business being on it. Uh, so in short, it, it was really inexpensive and allowed us to get on the road right away. But we didn't stay on the road for very long because um, it broke down quite a bit. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, the frequent failure of the equipment, we had a very high employee turnover. Um, so, you know, that's what prompted us to search for other solutions. At that time, we only had about 50 members. Um, so we, we realized quickly that this was not a long-term uh, equipment solution for us. So as Domingo and Jen both highlighted, um, we love bikes, bikes at work. We love this trailer. It's the same one Jen uses, but it's, it's only a single wheel version, um, the 64A model. We loved it. Um, we, we still have both of them and we love them to death. I can't say enough. Um, if you're in that in between of, you know, not quite enough for an electric assist, uh, but have a little bit of money to spare, I highly recommend this, uh, this trailer. Um, and this was our first version. We didn't have any of the sides up yet. We just use uh, the Rubbermaid bins. And like Domingo said, they're hard to find now. And that makes me really sad because um, they're amazing. 
and we would just bungee them down. Um, again, I'm not going to go over this because we've we've touched a lot on this. I feel like this whole webinar is a little bit of a like a an ad for bikes at work, um, but it's because they're great. All right, so this is our second version. Um, we made um, a little bit of a banner with this PVC pipe, and it allowed for our Rubbermaid bins to be a lot more stable, which was great. Um, at this point, we switched our business model from the swapping method to the clean-as-you-go method. Uh, so with this, what we would do is we'd go to a member's house. Uh, we would dump their compostables in the, one of the back three Rubbermaid bins, and then we would clean their bin on site with our cleaning equipment in the first Rubbermaid bin. So um, we were cleaning as we go. Here's just a pulled out version. Like Domingo said, we, oh, and Jen said that, you know, we have a hitch on the bike as well. Our bikes, we use a hybrid, uh, always hybrid bikes. And honestly, we don't put a ton of money into buying like new bikes because they break down so much because let's face it, bikes aren't made to haul for the most part this much weight. So they're going to break down. And I would rather invest in um, a mechanic like Nate who can do quick and, and better fixes every single day rather than buying a new bike, waking, waiting for it to break down and then going and bringing it in and paying a lot for that fix. Um, so what we do is we, we buy hybrid um, bikes either from the local co-op or from Craigslist um, and we just invest a lot in uh, daily maintenance of these of these bikes. Um, and also the banner is great for marketing. Like, like Jen said, this uh, being a bike hauler is pretty much being like a slow rolling um, ad which is great here's another picture of our riders at this point we upped the pay to one dollar and 95 cents per bin uh, a really cute story about these two is uh they both worked for tilthy rich and now they're married isn't that sweet compost love all right so uh, like i mentioned the pros um you know, oh, this is a great trailer. We did not have a lot of breakdowns. Um, it's really easy to operate. It increased our rider safety because of the turning radius and the ease. Um, and we had better marketing capability with that as well. The cons though, it was a little bit of a large investment where, for where we were at in our business at the time. Um, and it did decrease our surface area. So we had to kind of switch our, um, our, our operations model by uh, switching from the swapping to the uh, wash as you go. Oh, yes. So in 2017, actually March 1st of 2017, we uh, joined forces with Compost Now. Um, we decided that, you know, since Compost Now was operating in the same area as us, um, it didn't make a lot of sense for us to compete. And instead, it made a lot more sense if we joined forces and passions and talents and uh, grew this movement together. And so from there, Tilthy Rich became the bike division of Compost Now. I don't know if you can see my little cursor. Oh, no, go back. There we go. But there's Nate smiling. And there's me looking away from the camera. Okay. So Compost Now started in 2011 in Raleigh. Um, we now operate in three states, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Um, other than our bike division, we use Sprinter vans and box trucks. And we service anybody and everybody. Um, starting with, you know, households to universities and every office in between. Um, so with this merger, um, we had to make some big decisions here. Um, like Jen said, um, when you have a business that also uses vans uh, and, and vehicles uh, like cars, it's always going to be a constant battle. Um, and like Jen said, I always win as well <laughs> for right now. So um, you know, when I when we merged with Compost Now, we had to, you know, make some big decisions. And, and one of the big things was, all right, we want a, a community member, one of our members, if they're on a bike route or a van route to have the same amazing community uh, composting experience. Um, and so that means all of our operations had to be uniform. Um, and with the vans, they do a swapping method to because it's an increase in cleanliness and it's a higher standard. Um, and so we had to make sure that our bikes ran in that same uh, in that same operational standard. And so we had to figure out a way to go back to swapping. And we also had to figure a way, a way out to be more efficient. We needed to service more members in a shorter amount of time. So how are we going to do that? Um, after some research um, and talking with other community composters, uh, we decided to invest in electric assist trikes. Um, and we narrowed it down to a company called Main Street Pedicabs. 
which uh, they're located out of Boulder, Colorado. Um, this is a picture of one of their models. I actually went uh, and visited the facility while we were testing out which model we wanted to buy. Here's one model. Here's another one with a big box. Uh, I'm smiling. I really like that one, but we ended up not getting it because it wasn't as uh, affordable. Here's the, the website in case anybody's interested. Um, I'm sure people have seen these pedicabs all over, especially if you live in a city. Um, they're, they're manufactured by Main Street pedicabs. This is a picture of the trike we landed on. Um, and actually, this is a picture of the day they were delivered to our headquarters. Um, in the back is Justin, our our founder. Um, he was riding around on that that day, like all day when we delivered it because we were so excited. Um, so these bad boys are are expensive. Um, they're over three thousand dollars each. Um, so they're definitely a, a pretty big investment for us, and we we weren't quite there at the time, but we knew we had to make this decision if we wanted to scale our bike division. So this is the first uh, kind of phase. Um, at this point, we wanted Nate, who's who's pictured here, to be really comfortable with the equipment um, so that he can train the rest of our um, riders uh, appropriately and make sure that we're you know, handling this equipment with care and making sure that they're safe as well. Um, and so for, for the first couple months, Nate was the only one riding the trike. Everybody else was still using our Bikes at Work trailer, um, and we were still cleaning as we go. So we would still uh, dump the bins in that uh, yellow, uh, little yeah bin right here and then uh, we would wash the bins uh, and again this was just so Nate got used to this um, he's a bike mechanic but you know once you throw in a battery it, it becomes a whole nother thing and so we wanted to make sure that he had time to really get to know the equipment and be able to make the appropriate repairs and be able to train um, our riders all right so we're fast forwarding to this week where um, this is our newest you know, phase of these trikes. Um, once, you know, when we bought these, we we needed to switch from clean as you go to swapping. And so this was the way we could do it. Uh, we had somebody who was a welder um, and was one of our commercial members come in and built this uh, cage and frame for us so that we were able to stack bins. Um, and so how it kind of works is these are all of our clean bins. Uh, the, the lids are in, in this blue uh, container. Um, and what we would do is you we would go to each house and we would stack these full bins um, and then and then give them a clean bin um, so before um, with our bike at work trailers uh, the capacity was 22 we used to call it the tilthy 22 and that was the perfect amount for riders at one time um, to have uh, 22 houses so um, it was the perfect amount of you know good money for the riders and and not too hard on the equipment here um, the number that we found is uh, 45 so we're almost so we're doubling it which is pretty incredible um, and we're actually shortening the time so our riders are able to do double uh, the houses in, in a shorter amount of time and be less tired as well because the electric assist um, so that's pretty special I just want to give you all a little sneak peek of what's to come with our, our bike division um, Nate hasn't even seen this yet, so I wanted it to be a little bit of a surprise. Uh, this is Nate. We cropped him in <laughs> as the model. It's kind of funny. Um, so, oh, Jen, I'm so sad to hear about that accident because um, we actually had our very first accident in seven years a couple weeks ago as well. Um, we were, one of our riders were hit in a roundabout, which is ironic, um, and uh, with one of these trikes. So thankfully, because this trike is really sturdy, um, it, it could have been a lot worse, we think, but um, because of this, uh, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Uh, Kevin was our rider. He did hurt his shoulder and has been out for a couple weeks, um, but thankfully, workers' comp covers his time away and our insurance and covers um, the equipment and his injury. Um, but uh, after that accident, we kind of put our heads together and we wanted to figure out a way for us to be way more visible on the street. For, so this versus this. Um, and we, we just wanted to make sure we increased our safety for the for the riders. Um, so one, yes, this is awesome marketing. Like, look how beautiful that is. But also, we want to put flags on the back because we want to be highly visible. I don't know if you see it, but it says spokes and spoils division. I really like that. Here's the back. Um, again, marketing, but also um, safety. We want, we want to be visible. We want cars to see us. We, we want them to move out of the way. And we want them to respect us on the road. So that's a look at the back. Um, overall, the pros to this uh, the the trikes is 
it's way more efficient. Um, the larger surface area allows us to provide a better service to our members. Um, it allows our operations to be uniform. Um, we've, we're, we have happier and safer riders because of it. Um, and like Brenda mentioned, and I talked a lot about this at the compost conference, and I won't touch on it too much right now, but it does create the opportunity to build a more diverse team. Um, you don't have to just buy the perfect, or you don't just have to hire the professional, you know, cyclist who can ride in everything with any kind of equipment. Um, we wanted this to really be an equitable opportunity for community members um, to have a green, well-paying job. Um, and speaking of the well-paying job, we do pay all of our employees a Durham living wage, which is over $15 an hour. Um, right now, we do not pay our riders hourly, and that's because um, they they still make more money if we pay them per bin because the electric assist is so quick. So we pay them $2 a bin at this point, um, and we, uh, we also have them log their hours in T-sheets because we want to make sure that they're still getting paid more Per, um, if we pay them per bin. As soon as that crosses over, then we'll switch them to hourly. Um, okay, so some cons is, man, it's expensive, 3,000 a pop. Um, that's a lot of money. And um, for us, we with Tilthy, we had our equipment stolen uh, about five years ago. And so this gives me a little bit of anxiety <laughs> spending that kind of money on an equipment. Um, but again, it's what was necessary to scale this business model um, in our area. Also, there's some really unique equipment parts that cause some delays in, in maintenance. Um, so, you know, you can't just kind of ride the trike into the local um, bike shop and get certain parts. You, we have to get them from uh, Main Street Pedicabs or uh, another manufacturer similar. Um, so Nate sometimes has to kind of wait for things to come in. And most importantly with this, there is a big learning curve. Um, it's a complicated machine. Uh, batteries in general are really weird. I don't know about you guys, but batteries are strange. Um, and it's, it's, it's taken Nate a lot of research um, and work to figure out the best way to, um, to maintain these batteries. You know, how do you, can we charge overnight? Can we not? What's the best charging method? Like, can we ride in the rain? What kind of cover is required? Um, th there's a lot that goes into into maintaining that this piece of equipment and making sure that it lasts for a very long time. Um, and so we're really thankful for Nate's expertise um, and, and all the labor he's put into it. So before I uh, get off and meet myself, <laughs> um, I just wanted to touch on uh, two more quick, quick, quick things. And one is insurance, because I know community composters talk a lot about insurance um, and how you know difficult it can be to be insured. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about our experience. Um, we use um, EMC, they are our insurance company, and we use a broker called Southeastern Agency Group. Um, and our uh, policy for the trikes are a separate policy from the rest of our vehicles um, and we actually use an inland marine policy um, which kind of covers all transit uh, property for the most part. Um, it's a very weird policy. We pay about anywhere between $150 and $175 dollars a month uh, and that's that can go up and you know and down just depending um, especially when we think a lot about like accidents it went up a little bit. Um, what else, what else did I wanna talk about with that? Yes, the biggest advice I can give to community composters about um, insurance is to find and work with a broker who understands um, what you do. Because a lot of people wanna put us in a category and they don't understand the nuances in, in hauling and community composting. And so our broker, uh, his name is Bryce and he's been amazing and uh, he, specializes in waste management equipment and he's been able to really help us with this policy and get it down to an affordable rate for us um, so i definitely encourage you to ask around if people don't ask you further about what you do in your business model and they just give you a quote walk away because that's not the best quote you can find you got to get somebody who understands what you're doing um, other than that um i just yeah i just want to say thank you so much for having me and for having compost now and having nate here um i encourage you to ask us all questions um because you know domingo and jen and nate are all just awesome resources um and we're all really happy to answer any questions thank you guys thank you kat and thank you domingo and jen as well you guys are awesome um and i'm glad you brought up insurance because i mentioned at the top of the webinar that um we're going to do a few polling questions. Actually, we're going to do that now before we get into the Q&A. And one of them is what you think should our next spotlight 
topic beyond bike powered collection and insurance is one of those issues. So I'm glad you kind of teed that up for us. So, um, uh, and Kat, I mean, um, uh, yeah, Kat, I, you know, I just, I thought, you know, you starting off with the, uh, you know, on this equipment, your talk with like, you know, showing those slides of the repurposed materials made into trailers, the futon frame, but then, you know, there's some cons to that, they're too heavy, they break down, uh, but you don't, you don't necessarily have to spend, you know, more than a thousand dollars on a trailer if you want to repurpose. But I think it also underscores one of the biggest challenges that um, small scale community based micro composters are facing is the lack of appropriate equipment. I mean, Jen, you had to go to Europe to get your trike, you know, and then you mentioned the rubber made bins are harder to find. So we should at some point also talk about just working with manufacturers and suppliers to you know, be meeting the needs of this growing sector, not just bike haulers, but other micro composters. So we'll put a pin in that and come back to it at some point. So while we're, we're going to, we have a few polling questions uh, about the webinar, and then we're going to get into the Q&A. We have lots of time. So we only have about two questions. So type them in, guys. Okay, so yeah, Virginia, first poll. Um, now that you've heard from these three presenters, how inclined are you to, and the options that are coming up now will be, I uh, can't see your screen yet, Virginia, but they're going to be start collecting food scraps with bikes or learn more about bike hauling and equipment, too. And then three, reach out to bike haulers for additional Im information. And then we have a particular question about whether you'll consider electric assist. And I cannot still see the polling, so I guess that's just taking a while to come back to that. So actually, while we're waiting for the polling to come up, let me just ask the first, oh, there we go. Okay, so, and you can select all that apply, by the way. So, um, how likely are you to start collecting food scraps? Learn more, reach out to existing bike haulers or consider electric assist. All right, not quite half of you have voted. Here we go. All right, we're almost at 80% voted. All right, let's see the results. Um, okay, you guys have been very effective. Almost three quarters want to learn more, and more than half want to reach out to you guys, more than half want to consider electric assist, and almost half start collecting. Okay, next question has to do with on the equipment options that we shared today for a bike collection, has this webinar, and you select one this time, just give us an idea, do we have too much information, not enough information, about the right amount of information? All right, let's show results. Okay, definitely not too much. The right amount, okay, that wins, good. All right, two more quick questions. This one has to do with what I talked about already. What should our next topic be on bike powered collection? So we already have insurance, hauling permits, client relations, logistics routing, scaling up. And by the way, if you don't see one um, that is on here, please contact us and let us know what you'd like to hear more about. As I mentioned at the top of the call, there's many more bike haulers, so we want to tap our growing network to share information. All right, let's show a couple more votes coming in. All right, more than 80% have voted. Let's see, what's the number one? Ooh, it's always split. Okay, client relations and logistics routing is definitely winning. Boy, nobody wants to talk about insurance, Cat. Good thing you mentioned it today. All right, and then the very last question to poll is, how did you hear about this webinar? This just helps us figure out how to be marking these better. So the choices, pretty straightforward here. Email, social media, one of our speakers today or other. All right, let's see the results. Looks like it's mostly email outreach, so we will continue to do that. Um, all right, thank you for participating, and now for um, questions. So, um, uh, 
the first question we have, and and speakers, all of you can unmute, including you, Nate, uh, with Compost Now. And if we have any bad audio, I'll ask. Uh, you know, to, to meet you again. But um, any have any of the presenters heard of the Rad Burrow by Rad Power Bikes? It has a 750 pound capacity electric trike with a 40 plus mile range. So let me just go to compost now first. So Kat or Nate, have any of you heard of the Rad Burrow? I have not, Nate, have you? I have not, no. Domingo? I've heard a little bit about it, uh, but I haven't paid much attention because I, I tend to work with the scale that I have. And here my concern is that, um, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, type of trikes um, certainly have a weight capacity. Uh, and uh, here the, is the, the nature of the community uh, composter is how much I can fit, you know, that is reasonable for a biker. Even, even though you might have, have an assist, you still have to do a lot of pedaling. Uh, otherwise, you can have strains on the motor. And so, uh, and people that design this normally don't do it for, for you know, um, uh, for ha hauling uh, weight, like, uh, you know, when you carry food waste. Uh, they certainly can carry a lot, uh, but it's very variable, the amount of weight that we carry around. So I always wonder, you know, how well designed are these? I'm sure it is. It's a matter of also contacting them and asking them about the, the maximum load uh, that these uh, bikes can carry. <clears throat> yeah. And Jen, any any comments from you? Uh, no, I hadn't heard of it, but I am currently looking it up as we speak. <laughs> okay. All right. So one question for all of you is, what were some of the biggest challenges you came across in the first few months of operation? So we'll go backwards. Jen, want to start? Um, a few highlights. Well, I, oh God, I can't remember when we had some equipment theft, but we had a, our bike stolen pretty early on. So that was a kind of <laughs> a big issue. Um, but I think just, I mean, we'd always been using a vehicle and then switched to bike. So like the, just the different pace and kind of getting used to it and realizing that there's, there's more benefits other than, than speed and the bottom line, uh, to being on the bike. Yeah. Uh, Domingo. Uh, well, the challenge is basically balancing, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, carrying the, the the trailer with the you know your weight so balancing having a double stand is very very important because it stabilizes your 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 bike if you do not have a double stand what may happen is that the front wheel if it's turned you know a, the weight on the back can you know basically tip over your bike so i did a lot of tip overs i lost some of the you know uh, mirrors that i used uh, to be able to look at the vehicles in the back uh, because I, you know, I had to learn how to balance the bike. But with a double, a double stand, it was very uh, something that we acquired very quickly, and and it it worked out very nice for for us. So basically, it's that, and then learn learning how to really take a curve when you have a long uh, trailer. Uh, you know, you have to do wide turns. Uh, so that's something that you have to get into practice to avoid, you know, hitting cars or or, or even turning over your your trailer if you're not careful. Yeah, and, and on the double kickstand, Jen mentioned that that was a lifesaver for her. Oh, yeah. All right, Kat and and, uh, and or Nate, anything think, you want to add on biggest challenges? I think that uh, one of the, coming from a, a different background in biking, figuring out how much is a, is a good goal to have of what, what you can do in a day. Um, and so with the, with the mechanical trailers, the, um, it was, it was, people were doing about, 30 a day um, maximum, um, but then the transition from to the electric assist was also difficult. Figuring out, well, is this going to be something that we d double our routes, you know, um, or what, or or was it? And um, just the the trike is is <laughs> is funny to ride because you, it does balance, but it is very stiff, and you have to push. I'm, I'm miming with my hands that <laughs> forward, you know, on one side. And um, 
and it there's no leaning, so it's very it's awkward in that way. But um, that's just some of the elements mm -hmm. that came up. Kat, did you want to add anything? I mean, for me personally, Domingo, you hit it on the nail. Like I tipped my trailer so many times on my routes. Um, like you'd see me in the middle of the road scooping up the scraps. Like don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's definitely just you know no matter how much experience you have on a bike or how little you have like it, there's nothing like hauling <laughs> 350 pounds of food scraps behind you in whatever way you know we do so yeah. it's just it's hard sometimes um to share information when i keep wanting to say you just have to experience it yourself um but that's kind of the fun of this is being able to experiment and i think it's a lot different than with a truck or a car right i think it's it allows us to be more creative and kind of push the boundaries of, of hauling and that's yeah that's been pretty special good yeah. so we have a couple of questions on the actual collection on the uh at the at the curb so i'm going to combine them so there was one I'll, I'll i'll list them both but uh there was one any tips tricks for effective on the spot bucket cleaning and the one that's related to that by someone else is have any of you tried incorporating biodegradable bags into the collection process mm -hmm. rather than clean as you go or bin replacement. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> Domingo, go ahead. Okay, so listen, I, I'm very different from what many people do in, in, the, in, the, in the composting business. Uh, from the very the start go, I, I, I basically told my clients that they, I'm not swapping bins, I'm not using liners. Uh, if you want to use liners, you know, that's up to you, that's your, that's your extra cost but you don't require liners. And you're also responsible for cleaning your own bins. And that's part of sharing the responsibility and the cost of composting in the town. And every, uh, basically pay everybody bottom in, into that. So I just come in, weigh my bin, uh, you know, um, put their content in my 18 gallon bins and return their bins and they wash it. Basically they wash it on a weekly basis. Some people don't never wash it at all. I use a scraper sometimes to, you know, when things get soiled too much, uh, but I basically have a uh, share the responsibility of taking care of those bins, but you have to do it from the very beginning, because if you wanted to do that later, it might be very, very difficult. And I just felt that, you know, that's the way I want to run the business by sharing the responsibility. That's why I call them composter, I don't call them client. And by being composter, they participate in the process of setting aside the, the, the food scraps, but also in maintaining a, the, their bins. Okay, great. And Jen, what do you what do you do? Uh, we do the same model as Domingo. The customers are responsible for keeping their bins clean. Um, we recommend we don't use the biodegradable bags um, because we just have processors that don't like them. For processing material on our own, we can handle them, but I, I don't like them. Um, so we recommend if people want a line just for convenience to use paper bags and we our drivers and bikers also carry around uh i found masonry trowels that have rounded edges work really well for scraping we've tried out probably every kind of scraping tool um <laughs> that there is especially in the winter when buckets get material gets frozen in there um but a masonry trowel that's rounded at the edge is what i recommend Okay, and Kat, I think you really covered that you swap out the bin, so there's no on-spot cleaning. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we have we have some questions about weather. So I'm going to kind of combine these two, so you all can get to answer them. So there was, and I'm going to go through them all before I call them you guys. But Domingo, well, there's one for Domingo from somebody who's also located in Connecticut and asked if you find you have less customers in the winter due to weather and do you swap out the bins with your customers? We already dealt with the last, so no. Um, there's somebody else in central Maine, freezing cold and brutally hilly. Has anyone considered seasonal bike pickup and during the winter having the homeowner bring a bin to a central place yeah. like a transfer station and then a third question was what are your backup plans for when an employee does not show up and when weather is ex extreme so all of these relate to weather they're a little bit different so um kat i'm going to start with you so this has to do with and you've had snow i know you're in north carolina <laughs> so maybe this isn't as big an issue for you but you know what do you do when employee doesn't show up when the weather is ex ex extreme or when it's too cold yeah. in the winter just talk about weather Absolutely. Um, and Nate, I'm going to call on you to jump in in a second. So we actually just had this experience. I don't know if you heard, we got about 10 inches of snow in Durham. 
um, a couple days ago. So, uh, and you know what? We only took off Monday. Um, so we've been we've been riding through the snow. Uh, and basically, our policy is this: obviously, if um, you don't feel safe to ride, do not ride. First and foremost, do not ride. Um, because we have people with different experiences on the bike. Uh, Nate is like, I would say a professional cyclist at this point and other people are just, um, they're not at that level. So they're not as comfortable on, in the snow. Um, Nate does a lot to prep the bikes for, uh, the weather. And I'm going to have him jump in, um, in a minute to talk to you guys about that. Um, but if somebody doesn't show up and they don't communicate that to us, um, then, you know, we give people another chance, but if it happens again, then they can't ride with us. And that's because, um, we need people that are in invested in this movement, invested in bike calling. Um, and if you do that, that means one the other one of our teammates have to cover and we strain our operations and that's not good for anybody. Um, for the most part with policy though, with, uh, with, with weather, we'll still ride in rain um, and snow um, and, and all of the, in all of the weather, unless it's uh, lightning or it's a hurricane like Hurricane Florence or some, some other kind of very, very dangerous condition. Um, we do leave it up to the right individual riders to, to see if they feel safe. Um, but Nate, do you want to touch on the, the tires that you put together this last week? All right. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 well, I, I have to mention, I've been covering routes too. Um, when people um, call in or, or the van or head them over to the vans. Mm -hmm. um, but pretty much doing that. And then um, the tires are, uh, I'm, I'm looking for chains um, to try, but in the meantime, um, I made some studded tires um, and those worked, there was no sliding with those trikes that you saw um, and they weigh about 240 pounds. Um, and we did, I did have a flat yesterday. Uh, I went, I went, I went a full day without a flat and then another rider got a flat on one of them, but I put um, sheet metal screws through the inside um, out on the um, on the tire and then added another layer of inner tube underneath the uh, the tire and the tubes. Um, and then, so that was my, cause my main goal is the safety um, in this case. So uh, I was able to go up the hills um, you know, we have like 30 foot hills uh, in some some spots when well, it's all hilly, um, and I, I I might have skipped my tire about you know spun spun in place maybe five seconds once, um, and then I guess well, there's the issue of black ice, which is uh, we I think we've all seen that, um, mm -hmm. and with the temperatures getting up to 40 from 20 in a day, that gets to be an issue. The, the dark, um, we're trying, we try and stay out of the dark, or at least I do, but we get, we're looking into um, powerful bike lights, uh, like 800 lumens. Um, and then lastly, heat is also an issue. So in, in North Carolina, um, and I'm not that experienced with that, but just have water, that's all I know, <laughs> take breaks. Yeah. So Jen, what about you and, and weather and thinking about, you know, in the winter, central place or backup plans or things like that yeah we have because our biker um, is normally responsible for getting his own material after his route in a vehicle that vehicle is typically available it's not being used so it's available if if we have inclement weather and it has to be pretty extreme for him not to go out um, but we do have a backup built in um, with, we also budget more for rental vehicles in the winter time just because we know uh, we, yeah, we don't want him to feel unsafe out there. And um, there was one instance last year when I thought it was a little risky, but he wanted to go out. So we did and he ended up getting stuck um, out on his route and we had to go fill in and, if for some reason he's out, um, I'm filling in or, um, yeah, or my partner is filling in. Okay. And Domingo, I think you're in Connecticut, so yes. you have to answer this question. <laughs> so uh, we, have a, we have a saying over here, if, if the earth doesn't stop, we don't stop. Uh, of course, this has to do with safety also. So one thing that I do is I pay attention to if we're going to have a big snow or not. And I make a call and uh, I basically, you know, whether we 
uh, pick up the day before or we pay, pick up the day after. That's, that has happened before. So, um, you know, the issue here is how clean can the streets be? And the thing here that, the, you know, New Haven is very good for cleaning out the main roads, but the smaller roads, they are not that good unless you, you pay for them. Um, so uh, what we do again, we, we shift the dates uh, for picking up. Uh, and because we do our own composting, so we do our own, our own processing, you know, we can also delay the day that we process. Uh, the worst case scenario is that we use a car, uh, you know, in extreme, extreme weather uh, to pick up uh, the food waste and then bring, we, we bring all that food waste to a farm uh, nearby, uh, you know, a little bit out, uh, outside of the skirt, uh, given that the, our bins might be full of snow. Um, but the idea is to keep up, uh, to keep up and, uh, and not stop uh, and work year round as, as long as the, there's no risk uh, of injury for our bikers. One thing that I think is important is the use of, of uh, disc brakes are very good for, for you know, for, for this type of weather, the, 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 the winter weather. Uh, mainly when you're going downhill and you're having, you know, you have 300 pounds in the back of you. So you, you need to have that uh, to deal with. Uh, but that's what we do. We, we, oh, one thing that I want to mention about weather is that, you know, I ask all my clients to keep their bins inside uh, until the morning because many times they leave their bins uh, the, the, the day before and they're, they're frozen. And then you have to fight with that bin to be able to take the, out the, the, the content. The importance of, of using paper bags, like Jennifer was mentioning, or even newspaper, is great to avoid, the, <clears throat> you know, when the, uh, the organic residues gets uh, frozen in the bins. So that's something that I also pay into, uh, to attention otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, good. So we only have a few more minutes. I'm going to just try to get in one more question before we end. And for those of you who asked additional questions, I did try to um, focus on the ones that were related to equipment, which is the focus of today's webinar. That we had many questions on laws dealing with local municipalities, permitting, um, things like that. We had questions on marketing, which I think will be, and, and route um, issues, which it sounds like we'll be focusing on for our next webinar. So tune in. Um, to those, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I will share them with the presenters and maybe we'll get some of these answered. But last question for you all is, can you talk about how you've seen the bike powered collection movement grow in recent years? And are you seeing more companies initiatives develop in other cities or within your own community? So kind of just a general question of how you fit in, you know, to this growing movement and, um, uh, okay, so Domingo, we're going to go backwards. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, you know, the bike powered uh, food scraps collection is not for everybody. Uh, you know, this is for certain kind of people. Uh, you certainly can make a business out of it and, you know, you certainly can generate uh, some decent e income. But it requires people that are passionate, that really love what they're doing, that, you know, it requires to be in risky situations, in extreme weathers. And, so, you know, I see the new popping uh, enterprises are more into people that are using trucks that wants to be able to haul more and, and, and making arrangements with uh, bigger composters. So they're willing to go further uh, and not do the composting themselves. So again, it's, it's, it's for those people that believe on localizing the whole event on circulating these resources within the community. So, you know, you are uh, circulating not only uh, organic waste, you are, you know, improving soils and you're creating jobs locally. Anything that has to go beyond the realm of the city, it, it requires, you know, it's money that's getting out of the system. It's resources that are getting out of the system. So if you believe in that, then the local scale of bike power, food scrap is the way to go. Okay, great, Jen. Wow, that was a really great answer, Domingo. Um, yeah, I mean, you just, you have to constantly have that, like, mission ingrained in you to, like, stick with this, because it's hard, and uh, we have, uh, there's another uh, bike hauler, compost bike hauler in Philadelphia, which is so cool, um, uh, but outside of the city, I'm, I mean, other than what you said, Brenda, just that number from when I started, that's grown tremendously. That's really encouraging to hear, and I hope that that pattern keeps happening. Oh, and wait, I want to touch on the um, that winter question about the main person who asked about the seasonal collection and then the drop-off. I, 
I think anything is possible. Like if you just kind of do a, like a market survey and see, like if you have people that are interested in that, then even if no one else is doing it, you should totally try it out because it yeah. might just work specifically in your area. Yeah. Awesome. So Kat, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> how are you fit, fitting into this growing bike powered movement? Yeah. Um, I think what we've historically seen in the community composting world is a lot of haulers get into the bike business first. Um, you see like compost wheels, rust belt riders, um, and some others around the country who they put a foot in the door in the community composting world by using bikes, by hauling with bikes. And it's because, um, you know, it, it requires less upfront capital. Um, it it kind of goes with their original mission of like reducing you know, emissions and also, you know, reducing food waste. Um, something that we're trying to do with our bike division at Compost Now is, is to see, is this scalable? Um, can we scale this um, to be as competitive as our van division? Um, can we scale it to be multi-cityed? Um, how can we scale this to be uh, something that's not just, you know, a passion project of ours or something that we believe, you know, like we believe in because it, it you know, it helps our sustainability goals, but um, are we able to scale our bike division for it to, you know, work for our business in general? And so um, we're kind of viewing our bike division right now in Durham as a platform for us to uh, copy it and do it in downtown Raleigh, do it in yeah. Charleston, do it in Atlanta, you know, and, and I think that's, if we can do it well and we can, and we're proving that we can, and Nate's definitely proving that as well. Um, I think we can start to see this being, you know, a real, like real viable hauling um, method. And I think Jen and Domingo are awesome examples of a success story um, and being able to scale in, in the bike division. So that's where I think we yeah. fit in. Great. And I think you all are definitely part of the growing movement. I mean, we've got fertile ground, bike hall in Oklahoma City. We have the pedal people in Massachusetts. We have BK Rod in Brooklyn, New York, Common Ground in Manhattan, the compost peddlers in Austin. You guys are everywhere. For those of you who are interested in getting into the space, we have a community composter coalition and we have a bike group. So please consider joining that. And with that, I wanna thank again our presenters and for all of you for listening in today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you.